So in the seventh theme, uh, we look at the growth of productivity. And I start with um, classic growth accounting and uh, index number approaches. So let me remind you this slide that uh, we already discussed in the introduction lecture. So I've indicated that uh, productivity growth uh, depends on uh, uh, three sources of growth. Uh, one is obviously technical progress. We have better technologies over time. Another source is efficiency improvement. And this efficiency part we have, of course, uh, very thoroughly discussed uh, so far in the static setting. So now I will just move it to the, to the more intertemporal setting of, of efficiency improvement or efficiency change. And finally, I've also indicated that there is uh, also structural changes possible, for example, entry and exit of uh, firms or, or plants or units, uh, as well as reallocation of resources between units. So my plan is that as this theme seven, I first take this, um, uh, partly this measurement of uh, technical progress as a new topic. I also, also move this efficiency improvement to the intertemporal setting and look at how do we measure this uh, uh, productivity growth uh, uh, given a, a balanced panel of uh, units. As themes eight, then, then we, we discuss what happens if we have a new firms that are entering and how to more include this uh, component of structural change into the equation. So let's start by looking at um, how to decompose the um, uh, economic growth and how to, what is the role of uh, productivity growth or in some sense technical change in the, in the uh, economic growth at the macro level. So I've already mentioned this uh, Robert Solow's work uh, uh, in the 1950s. So let's look in a little bit more detail this, uh, this solo, solo model. So let's assume just um, two inputs denoted by K and L. So K is capital and, and labor, labor L. And uh, here I slightly uh, deviate from the previous notation. So I'd usually had uh, output indicated by U, but now we have uh, output indicated by, by so sorry, earlier it was output was Y, now it is Q. And this Q, you can think about it as quantity of output. So it could be, for example, quantity index of some, uh, some uh, multiple output setting when you have, if you think about the economy, there is, of course, several dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of different outputs. And uh, we somehow need to aggregate them to, to output quantity index. So let's think about Q as an output quantity index. And um, so we have a production function F, like, like before, and this output is a function of capital and labor. And uh, to model technical change, then Solo assumes so-called Higgs neutral technical change. So it's a function A, which depends on time T. So this, uh, this function A is simply shifting this uh, production function uh, upward over time if there is technical progress. So next, uh, we, I, I have here copied some formulas from Solow's paper. So if we take uh, partial derivatives of the equation with respect to the time t, and uh, then we also, so these partial derivatives are, the, are indicated by this uh, dot on top of q, a, k, and l. And then we can also measure them proportionately. So, so if you think about the percentage change of, uh, of uh, GDP, so that would be this uh, Q dot divided by Q. So this equation illustrates that, uh, that the economic growth in this model depends on three things. So there is this uh, technical change, this, uh, this A part, and then there is contribution of capital and ca contribution of labor. So when, when we have more resources through capital stock increasing or, or labor force increasing, that, that, of course, uh, uh, contributes to the GDP growth. Uh, but then the third source is this um, uh, technical change A. So, so in this, this formulation, we do not assume any, any type of inefficiency in the, in the economy. So this is only, only technical change. And this kind of classical economic view is that, uh, that uh, productivity growth is uh, more or less a synonymous to, to technical change. 
So in this framework, then, uh, Solo later assumes that, uh, that if this uh, capital and labor are paid uh, marginal products, and uh, I, I forgot to mention that this uh, WK and WL were just the, the um, output elasticities of capital and output elasticity of labor, respectively. So if we assume that, uh, that markets are more or less competitive uh, and capital and labor are paid their marginal products, then we could simply uh, estimate those uh, WK and WL as, as cost shares of capital and labor. And this, this formulation then gives rise to the so-called uh, growth accounting approach to measuring total productivity. So on the bottom part of the of the equation starting from this solos result, uh, uh, I have just um, first interpreted in words. So this um, with red font, this uh, this uh, this uh, conceptual equation that real GDP growth equals uh, uh, productivity growth plus uh, plus uh, capital growth plus labor growth, uh, and of course this capital and labor growth are weighted by this cost shares. Um, notice that we can simply measure based on on uh, uh, na national account data, what is the GDP growth, and we can also also just uh, see from uh, aggregate uh, level data that what is the capital growth and what is the labor, labor growth. So therefore, very simple way to calculate then the productivity growth is to just take it as a residual. So, so subtract from the GDP growth uh, the contributions of capital and labor, and then what is this unexplained part of the GDP growth is then attributed as uh, productivity growth. So this is the, the so-called growth accounting approach, where we simply, we do not need to estimate anything, we just uh, just uh, take this productivity growth as the, as the residual. So this is the term solo residual refers to this, uh, this, this uh, fact that, uh, that uh, productivity growth is simply this unexplained part of the the economic growth. So I mentioned also also before that this Q uh, we can think about it as a quantity index, and I emphasize here that it's a, it's a real GDP growth. So obviously it's not the nominal GDP growth, but it should be first deflated for the for the for the price changes. And I also mentioned that uh, typically, of course, in economy there's a very large number of uh, goods and services that are first aggregated to calculate the the GDP. So this naturally then gives a bridge to the to the index numbers. How do we actually get then this price index that we can use as a deflator? And what would be then this kind of uh, corresponding quantity index? So in fact, this um, index theory has a very long history in uh, in economics. So I have on this slide taken some some uh, equations from a paper by Devert and Nakamura. And uh, this summarizes very up to this classic, uh, classic indices by Pasha, Laspers and uh, Irving Fisher. So let's think about first this, uh, this uh, quantity index. So if we want to aggregate this uh, uh, capital M outputs uh, and we want to measure that how much this uh, uh, aggregate output has changed from period S, which is in, labeled as the base period. And then there is the target period T. So, so we can think of this T as some later period after, after S. And uh, these uh, outputs are, have prices indicated by P. So in these formulas, uh, superscript indicates this, whether it's a base period S or target period T. And uh, in the first equation, number 14, we consider the, the partial index from uh, 1874. And uh, notice there that it's, we can think about this as a, as a weighted sum of outputs, and these, these prices are used as the index weights. Okay. So it is essentially a ratio of this, of this uh, weighted outputs. And uh, in the uh, nominator, we have the uh, output y outputs y in uh, in the target period t, whereas in the denominator we have outputs y in the base period s. So if we had just single output, then then it would be the ratio of uh, of 
output uh, in period T and output in period S, so how much we the output has grown. So uh, the idea of the of the partial index is then to use these uh, prices of the target period T as the as the index weights. So if we then consider this uh, equation number fifteen, the second equation, so that's the last pairs uh, index that was proposed about the same time in the 1870s. And uh, notice that the structure of this index is very similar to the, to the partial index. Uh, the only difference is that it uses the prices uh, of, of the base period S. So notice that for this P, there is superscript S rather than superscript T. So that's, that's the superscript of this price weights uh, P is the only difference between equations 14 and 15. So again, the partial index uses uh, prices of the target periods as index weights, whereas last pairs index uses uh, prices of the base period S as the index weights. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. So then in the 1920s, the uh, uh, eminent economist of that time, Irving Fisher, then uh, propose that since we do not have really good reason to prefer either the prices of the base period or the target period, so why don't we take uh, simply the uh, geometric mean of these two indices? So that is this equation 16. So in this case, the geometric mean would be simply, we can multiply this uh, partial index and last pairs index and uh, take the square root of the, of the resulting product. So that's the geometric mean of the of these two indices. So there are some nice properties with this uh, with this Fisher index. So I have taken one one property here in the on the bottom row from this uh, paper by Devert and Nakamura. So this is of course this quantity indices are also closely related to the to the um, uh, price indices. So suppose that we do the same kind of index but we then measure price index. So what is the what is the inflation in these outputs in some sense? So let's denote the, the price index by capital P. And to obtain this kind of corresponding price indices, we would just need to reverse these roles of the prices and quantities. So we would measure the change in the prices, but weighted by the, by the quantities. So in some sense, if we would just uh, uh, reverse this uh, P and uh, Y in those equations 14, 15, and 16, then we would have the price index. And let me note from this uh, bottom equation, starting from the right actually, that if we multiply such kind of uh, Fisher price index and quantity index, so this product of uh, QF and PF, then we directly get the, the change in the, in the nominal revenues. So it, this R refers to total revenue, and it is, it is then the, uh, change in the, in the revenue from base period S to the target period T. So it's the ratio of RT divided by RS. So that would be in some sense like, a, like change in the, in the total turnover of all, all the companies. So in that sense, it's, it's quite intuitive. If you, if you multiply the uh, quantity index and price index, so you have the quantity change times price change, you have the total uh, turnover change as a result. Uh, the classical uh, partial and last pairs indices do not have this kind of uh, property. So as the equation shows, if we, if we want to take this kind of product of price indices and, and quantity indices and want to get this kind of turnover change as the, as the result, so then we should actually multiply the partial qu quantity index with the last pairs price index. Or alternatively, if we take last pairs quantity index, we need to multiply it with the partial type uh, price index to get this result. So uh, this also comes from the fact that, uh, that these uh, partial and last pairs indices uh, are, are not really that um, uh, symmetric because, uh, because they only you consider the, either, the, uh, either the base period prices or the target period prices for the quantity index. So, so in that sense, the nice feature of the Fisher index is that it considers prices of both base period and the target period. So it's in that sense more symmetric with respect to this uh, price change. 
So this is this is a kind of brief introduction to this uh, to this classical index numbers. Um, I believe none of these uh, classical references considered really productivity growth, but uh, but later of course uh, this kind of um, uh, quantity indices particularly we can utilize directly for measuring productivity growth, and um, and uh, here is one example of the so-called Fisher total factor productivity index. So um, if we think about productivity, uh, productivity growth as a, as a, as a ratio of the output growth and input growth, then also in the introductory lecture, I emphasize that, uh, that uh, the main challenge is to somehow aggregate this uh, multiple outputs and multiple inputs of the, of the economy. So, one possibility is to first then use this, uh, this um, uh, quantity indices of the classic index theory and first compose uh, an uh, output quantity index and then compose an input quantity index and then simply take the ratio. And uh, uh, this, this kind of quantity index of, uh, of productivity, so TFP index, uh, uh, is commonly attributed to, to Irving Fisher, even if uh, he didn't really uh, measure productivity explicitly. But it's it's uh, quite straightforward to utilize the the similar idea to, to measuring productivity directly. So this is slightly different from the growth accounting, where you only had this this labor and capital. Whereas here in this uh, uh, index theory approach, we can of course have also also intermediate inputs such as energy and materials and and so on, and also we can we can explicitly consider multiple outputs. The main main thing is that we of course need to have some some price weights to to form these quantity indices. So this is a formulation of the Fisher TFP index that I have taken from the uh, article with Timo Sipilainen in uh, two thousand nine, and here we have expressed these uh, quantity indices. So when we refer to this Fisher output quantity indices, we use a capital F. Uh, uh, subscript uh, Y for output and subscript R X for the inputs. And uh, P again refers to the output prices and W refers to input prices. And notice that all these uh, uh, prices and uh, output and input quantities, they are here expressed uh, using a vector. So this bold font refers to that it's, it's a vector of, uh, of uh, M outputs and S inputs. And I believe that these, uh, these formulations of the Fisher index also help you to, to, um, uh, to visualize maybe per, perhaps better this, uh, how, the, how the Fisher index operates. So notice that firstly that this, uh, this TFP index is just a ratio of this uh, uh, output quantity index and input quantity index. So the output quantity index just refers to this uh, growth of output and input quantity index uh, refers to the growth of input. So we have this kind of aggregate output growth divided by aggregate input growth. And to measure the aggregate output growth, if you use the Fisher output quantity index like before, then um, uh, notice that, uh, that it, is, uh, it is the geometric mean of this Barsh and Las Perez types indices. And uh, so these ratios always have the output vector y. In the, in the nominator, we have uh, output vector y in the target period. And here I have denoted for, uh, perhaps for more intuitively, this, uh, if we start from base period zero and the target period is one, so, so moving from period zero to period one, uh, we have this vector, uh, output vector y in period one, always in the nominator of these ratios. And uh, base period output vector y, y zero is always in the denominator. And in this uh, geometric mean, notice that these uh, price weights, they are always the same in, in the ratio. So, so in the first, uh, first ratio, we use the uh, uh, prices of the base period. In the second ratio, we use prices of the target period. And then the idea of the Fisher index was to, was to take the geometric mean of the two. And similar then applies to the input, input quantity index, of course. So even though the formula might look like uh, like to some extent uh, tedious or something, 
there's not really any any estimation or optimization needed so this is something that is very easy to uh, easy to calculate for example in in uh, excel or whatever so if you have this kind of uh, price data and quantity data this is very very easy to calculate so that's one example of course so so fisher tfp index uh, so there's of course also other other type of quantity indices that could be could be used uh, uh, in compared to this partial last pairs of course fisher uh, Fisher index has this nice property that it doesn't give any any preference to either base period or target period, but takes the geometric mean of the two. Uh, there's another quite commonly used uh, quantity index that is also used for the productivity measurement. Uh, and uh, this is interesting because it was actually uh, developed by uh, Leo Turnquist, uh, who was the... Um, uh, professor of statistics at the University of Helsinki, and this uh, originally the original reference to this index uh, goes back to this actually this Bank of Finland monthly bulletin where the, the, it was uh, developed for the Bank of Finland's consumption price index. So, let me briefly illustrate you the idea of the Turnquist index or how it differs from the from the Fisher index. So notice that in this uh, partial last pairs and Fisher indices, we use the uh, prices as the as the weights of the quantity index. So we took, took weighted sums, or in some sense weighted averages of the of the output vectors. Uh, Turnquist then uses uh, geometric averages. So I have here highlighted with this red box that, that, that instead of using weighted averages, it's now weighted geometric averages. And uh, very often in, in this uh, index theory, uh, geometric means are preferred over, over arithmetic means. And again, the formula might look a little bit uh, scary or tedious, but um, I have also highlighted here this, this final component where actually all of the action, action is. So notice that uh, this is now expressed uh, in log terms. So the formula is from the Devet and Nakamura paper that I, I cited already before. So we simply consider again the ratios of uh, uh, output in period T and output in period S. So the sub subscript M refers to particular um, M and the sum over all M. And, and this was expressed in log terms. So then we weight this kind of changes or log changes in the particular output uh, and uh, this uh, large expression in the brackets here is then just uh, uh, refers to the to the average cost share of this particular m or oh, sorry now it is the revenue shares when we talk about outputs in the input side it would be cost shares in the revenue uh, in the output side it's revenue shares so all of this kind of this large expression in the brackets it's simply uh, this index weights, which is not, not considered by the price directly, but it is the revenue share. So this uh, functional form is, in fact, if you think about it, uh, this functional form of the Turnquist index is the same as that of the Cobb-Douglas production function. So similar to the Cobb-Douglas production function, these, um, these uh, quantities of index interest here the, it is this change in output quantity. They are weighted by uh, this uh, exponent. So it's kind of a log, uh, weighted average in terms of log terms. And, and here are these kind of revenue shares are used as the weights rather that, than prices as such. And this is uh, uh, quite commonly used, uh, for example, in uh, statistical agencies to form, form uh, price indices or quantity indices. And similarly, if we, if we use the Turnquist index to calculate the, the output quantity index and the input quantity index, then we could also have the resulting Turnquist TFP index. And uh, in my impression, the Statistics Finland is uh, still using the Turnquist TFP index for this kind of official TFP statistics. So to summarize this, um, uh, we have considered now this growth accounting and uh, TFP indices. Uh, both types of approaches are very widely used in uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, productivity studies, typically at the country level. 
and um, in that sense it's it's uh, maybe the main appealing feature is that there's no no estimation whatsoever needed so it it really suits the purposes of uh, some statistical agencies who just can can uh, uh, compile these required data and then just calculate of course this uh, these indices rely on on uh, very detailed price information covering all inputs and outputs that are taken into account in the in the productivity measurement and um, so this kind of uh, fact that there is no no estimation might be some sense also uh, mislead with its simplicity because um, uh, for example it's it's often wide, often mistakenly claimed that there is for example no no issues with endogeneity for example because there's no estimation also but uh, but it's easy to see that uh, if there is a problem with the endogeneity in the econometric estimation this kind of endogeneity would also cause bias in the in the index number or growth accounting approaches similarly so the fact that uh, that uh, that uh, this kind of estimation issues are not explicitly considered uh, it doesn't mean that they are they are resolved by by avoiding the estimation it may be actually better to uh, explicitly consider them at the estimation stage and i have here listed also some of the issues that uh, that this uh, uh, price information might have so if you think about this uh, this uh, um, these factors of production obvious example is the capital stock or capital services so the opportunity cost of capital is uh, notoriously hard to measure mainly because we do not really observe separate quantities of capital or, or prices of capital we typically only observe the uh, investment in capital but not really the quantities separated from the prices and the whole concept of okay what's the price and what's the quantity of capital is somewhat slippery and uh, then of course not only price and quantity but also what about the quality if we think about the uh, investment in the ICT capital such as computers or smartphones uh, so the quality has been improved very dramatically over the past uh, recent decades uh, and uh, when we just look at the investment stream then uh, then this kind of quality changes tend to be ignored quality of course also concerns the labor input what about changes in in labor skills over time education level gain of experience and so on and so on then there can be of course uh, new goods introduced to the market goods that become obsolete and, and are no longer used uh, so what is the price of uh, if you think about some kind of long long-term uh, productivity study then what would be the price of the iphone in the 1980s or 1990s when it was not even introduced yet that's obviously not possible to obtain very easily then we have a plenty of um, non-market goods environmental bad such as pollution of course is, is a, an important example we might have public goods like uh, like uh, national defense such kind of uh, goods are also hard to price uh, then of course prices might be perturbed by imperfect competition we have considered the example of natural monopolies in this course but then also the government intervention can can influence the prices for example taxes subsidies tariffs and so on so while this kind of idea of using the market market prices for valuing this uh, um, inputs and outputs and using them as aggregation weights i hope that this uh, this uh, certainly incomplete list of uh, of issues convinces you that perhaps the perhaps the prices are not uh, not always so so uh, dependable also so this motivates then the our next topic looking at this uh, more kind of shadow price based uh, uh, Malmquist index approach 